Hey y'all, welcome or welcome back to the channel. If you are new here, my name is Kaya and today we are going to be talking about the satanic panic and its history with metal music. There's a lot to unpack here with this story and I'm going to cover a lot of different topics and events, all of which happened in the United States. Some of these events you will probably be familiar with, but I'm hoping that there's some that you are not. Now, I think it can also go without saying that I am obviously not of the generation that experienced or lived through the satanic panic. So I tried my best to research as much as I could. However, there will always be things that I miss. So I invite you to com comment down below and share your experience experiences on the satanic panic. This story is quite fascinating, so without further ado, let's get right into it. Do you know what she did? Y'all can't sing the door bell. The car breaks! And that they somehow wanted me to participate in something, but I have a child for the car Satanic group. Yes. Very beautiful. He's an angel. Why would he look like some monster? He's capable of looking just like you. We play every night before we go on stage. I am not into Satanism. I'm not a devil worshiper. I've never been involved in black magic personally at all. What an excellent day for an exorcism. Before we get into the juicy bits of the 1980s, in order to provide context, we are going to have to rewind the clock a little bit first. So grab your bell bottoms, put on your flower crown, and let's rewind to the 60s. There were many breakthroughs for music, culture, and history during the decade of the 1960s. Not only was there the presidential assassination of John F. Kennedy in 1963, followed by the civil rights movement a year later in 1964, there was also the Vietnam War in full effect during this entire decade, which was closely tied with the birth of the hippie movement. Millions of young adults and teenagers were creating a counterculture built on drugs, rock music, and sexual liberation. Music was beginning to blossom into something the world had never seen. Bands such as the Beach Boys and the Beatles were releasing iconic records during this time, such as Pet Sounds and the White Album. These albums would define the standard for what an album should be, with higher production and sound quality, more songs and an overall better listening experience. This created the name we now know of as the Long Play, or LP for short. During this late 60s era, Led Zeppelin debuted with their self-titled record in 1968, and Led Zeppelin II in 1969. Many declare this latter album as being the very first heavy metal record. Led Zeppelin was also one of the earliest bands to be accused of devil worshipping and having satanic messaging in their music. Led Zeppelin's guitarists had an obsession with the works of Aleister Crawley, one of the most famous occultist writers of all time. Jimmy Page owned a ton of Crowley's manuscripts and even purchased the Boleskine House in Scotland, which Crowley had once resided in. Page also sometimes wore occult symbols while performing on stage. We can also talk about Woodstock and Jimi Hendrix in his prime, but among all of this flower power in the 1960s, there was a much darker, more sinister presence lurking. This is where I believe the true birth of modern satanic culture began. In 1966, the very first Church of Satan was formed in San Francisco, California by Anton LaVey. Anton LaVey was an American musician, author, and Satanist who also went on to publish several books, his most notable piece being the Satanic Bible, which was published in 1969. The Satanic Bible is a collection of essays, observations, and rituals. It is a central religious text of LaVeyan Satanism and is considered the foundation of Satanic ideology and beliefs. It has been described as the most important document to influence contemporary Satanism. That same year, Charles Mann Manson, famous American cult leader to the Manson family, along with some of his cult members, committed a series of at least nine murders in California, terrorizing the state with maximum media attention. Now, it's not lost on me that the storylines of both Charles Manson and Anton LaVey's are based in California, and throughout my research, it was quite eerie to realize that many of the topics I will be discussing in today's video are based in California. 
What are the chances of these two famous cult figures both being in the same state at the same time? Both promoting the occult and bringing it to the awareness of the public and the media and well-documented media pieces. This could spark the conversation of Hollywood being satanic, but that is an entirely different Easter egg. After the capture of Charles Manson came the 1970s, where things blossomed even further. I will give Led Zeppelin credit for helping to lay the foundation for heavy metal music at such an early time, but in terms of metal, the most iconic first release for the entire birth of the genre has to be the release of Black Sabbath's self-titled record, which came out in February of 1970. After the release of this album, rumors began to spread of Black Sabbath being a satanic band and being involved in the occult. Black Sabbath itself stands for a name that refers to a meeting of those who practice witchcraft or witches' Sabbath or other occult or superstitious rites. This definition of the band name, paired with the ever-creepy album cover, The Witch with No Pupils and the haunting abandoned castle in the background, Black Sabbath was spooky and mysterious for many listeners during this era. Keep in mind, music at this time was not this dark or heavy. Even the lyrics of the songs were enough to spook people. It was a sound with lyrical content nobody had heard or seen before. Ozzy Osbourne himself said in an interview that the band name was inspired from the movie Black Sabbath, which was being played at a cinema across the street from a coffee shop they were at. While doing my research, I found several threads of people sharing their experiences of the satanic panic and listening to this music during this time. Here's one experience talking about their first time listening to Black Sabbath as a kid. By the early 70s, the bloom was off the rose. Hippies weren't redefining culture anymore. Charles Manson had turned the perception of them into drug-addled, dangerous people who were probably suffering from mental issues. So hearing and seeing the adult world around me feel this way about long-haired young people that dressed a certain way, of course made me curious. Which led me to listen to my older sister's records and most importantly, stare at the album covers and liners endlessly. The album cover for Black Sabbath scared the crap out of me, and the paranoid cover made me uneasy, but the music spoke to me. That sound spoke to me. I loved everything that they put out. A lot of the other bands looked wimpy to me in comparison, except for Zeppelin. All the rumors of devil worshipping and the stories of Bonham and Peter Grant's violence made them a dangerous band for a kid to follow. Culturally, I feel like Sabbath was largely ignored. I don't remember anything much being written about them. My friends and classmates referred to this music as hard rock, or also acid rock, and not a single girl that I knew liked the band. But my friends and I felt like we were in on a secret that no one else was aware existed. Now I couldn't verify whether this news piece on Black Sabbath had made waves in the United States at the time, but it certainly did in England, and I still think it has some importance to the story. In the early 1970s, an American nurse was found dead with the Paranoid album playing on her turntable. The album's possible influence in her death was mentioned in the inquest, but ultimately it was decided that Black Sabbath were not to blame for her passing. A lot of the words in the songs, a lot of the moods of the songs, are aggressive, Tony Iommi acknowledged, especially in the early days, satanic if you like. That was the way it felt, so that was the way we played. But it got out of hand. With Paranoid in England, for instance, there was a girl found dead, a nurse. She was dead in her room with her album on the turntable going around. And it was taken to court saying that it was because of the album that she was depressed and died, which was totally ridiculous, I think. Groundbreaking music wasn't the only thing being created during this decade. Cinema was also beginning to change and break the boundaries of what was possible and what was not. And as if it was some cruel, evil coincidence, there were also many of the most well-known serial killers beginning their torturous journey throughout the United States. Starting in the same state as Anthony LaVey and Charles Manson, the Zodiac Killer began his murdering spree in San Francisco, California in 1968, and would continue throughout the 1970s, never being caught. In 1973, what was known as the most terrifying horror movie ever to be filmed, The Exorcist, would hit the big screen, scaring many children and their parents. 
My own mother, who was a child during this time, said she cannot even hear stories about The Exorcist, as this movie still terrifies her to this day. Following The Exorcist, you also had the release of tabletop fantasy game Dungeons and Dragons in 1974, which as most of you know if you watch Stranger Things, had a role to play in the satanic panic. Huge cult films such as Halloween, Amityville Horror, Carrie, and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre also were being released before 1980. To make matters worse, by the mid-1970s, even more serial killers were beginning to show themselves. Famous names such as Ted Bundy had an active few years from 1974 to 1978. BTK or Bind, Torture, Kill was actively murdering people from 1974 to 1991, and The Son of Sam was active in 1976. And if that wasn't enough to scare the pants off of you as a child or parent, maybe also knowing that Jeffrey Dahmer, the literal human cannibal, also became active during the late 1970s. He was not apprehended until 1991. Jeffrey Dahmer even said he loved to listen to Black Sabbath while he was planning out his killings. Specifically, he liked the song Iron Man. Tension would get worse when in 1979, Dungeons and Dragons would be blamed for the death of a young man. In 1979, 16-year-old James Dallas Egbert III was discovered to be missing from his dorm at Michigan State University. The private investigator hired by his parents believed that not only was it due to foul play, but it was also due to his history of playing D&D or Dungeons and Dragons. Unfortunately, Egbert was suffering from mental health issues and drug addiction that resulted in him taking refuge in the utility tunnels underneath the school. He ultimately died in 1980 and many still believed that the cause of his untimely death was D&D. I think it's safe to say that by the time 1980 rolled around, the general public had been through so much trauma and had been exposed to so much new, dark, and mysterious content that it's not really surprising that many ended up believing in mass satanic rituals throughout the United States. Can you really blame a parent for being terrified for their children's safety when three of the most famous serial killers are all active at the same time? or being scared of some of the music that these serial killers listen to that also praised the devil? I certainly can't. The 1980s, probably the most iconic decade for fashion, cultural icons, movies, and music. Not only was there heavy synths in every pop song on the radio, Women wore big poofy updos and loud outfits, while most men greased up and wore leather jackets and tight jeans. The 1980s really was a new era of self-expression and creativity, one that thrived on the brighter, the bolder. Hardcore punk, heavy metal, and thrash metal were truly born in this decade, to the fear of some and to the pleasure of many. But we can't talk about the growth of heavy metal without talking about the launch of MTV in 1981. Heavy metal had a heyday in the 80s with bands like Motley Crue, Guns N' Roses, Quiet Riot, and Def Leppard dominating the Billboard Top 10 charts. Metallica, Anthrax, Megadeth, and Slayer were racking up Grammy Award nominations. The loud guitars and screaming vocals were a catharsis during a time of social, economic, and political conservatism. America was still clinging to traditional values set forth in the 50s and shaken in the 60s and 70s. Typically, it is believed that traditional Christian families were at the height of the anti-satanic movement. Women began to enter the workforce in larger numbers, resulting in latchkey kids or unsupervised children between the ages of 5 and 13 who care for themselves after the school day until their parents or guardians return home. Meanwhile, the launch of MTV in 1981 introduced imagery of bands and corpse paint performing against hellish flames nationwide. Nightmarish album artwork was on display in the windows of record stores everywhere exposing the youth to images of blood, bones, and violence. It was the perfect breeding ground for the witch hunt to follow. Heavy metal was targeted as a recruitment tool for the Satanists to lure innocent youth into their coven. The big four were born in this decade. Metallica in their prime released killer albums such as Kill 'Em All and Ride the Lightning, 
the latter having an electric chair as the forefront of the cover. Slayer, who in my opinion laid down the foundation for death metal even though they are a thrash metal band, broke even more boundaries with their satanic stars, dark attire on stage, and creepy and satanic lyrics. Judas Priest, of course, was already receiving accusations of satanic handlings just based on their name alone. Iron Maiden was another metal band making waves in the early 1980s for their amazing yet terrifyingly named record, Number of the Beast. The Number of the Beast is the third studio album by British heavy metal band Iron Maiden, and many say that this album was the most important metal record that was released in the decade. The Number of the Beast was met with critical and commercial success and became the band's first album to top the UK Albums chart and reach the top 40 of the US Billboard 200. The album produced the singles Run to the Hills and The Number of the Beast, the former of which became the band's first top 10 UK single. Heavy metal and thrash metal bands were now at the forefront of the conversation. Churches across the nation hosted record burning parties. At a Huntsville, North Carolina gathering in 1982, a former rocker turned pastor said he believed that Satan was possessing the singers and manipulating their voices so that subliminally implanted backward messages could be placed on the record to destroy the youth of America. Iron Maiden experienced this firsthand when people were going as far as to organize public burnings of the band's discography. Some religious groups smashed their records with hammers instead of burning them for fear of inhaling toxic fumes from the burning vinyl. Venues were sometimes surrounded by activists who handed out leaflets and, in one case, a 25-foot cross was carried in protest. Steve Harris, the bass player of Iron Maiden, has stated, it was mad. They completely got the wrong end of the stick. They obviously hadn't read the lyrics. They just wanted to believe all that rubbish about us being Satanists. Interestingly enough, however, even though the band did not claim to do anything Satanic, music press reports told stories of unexplained phenomena occurring during the sessions at Battery Studios while Iron Maiden was recording The Number of the Beast. Phenomena such as lights turning on and off their own accord and the recording gear mysteriously breaking down. These odd occurrences climaxed when Birch was involved in a car accident with a minibus transporting a group of nuns, after which he was presented with a repair bill for 666 pounds. Fans were accused of backmasking, which is the practice of hiding subliminal messages in their music that can only be heard when you play the song backwards. The concept dates back to the Beatles' White Album, with claims that if you play Revolution 9 backwards, you hear the message, turn me on, dead man. In 1981, a Michigan-based minister, Michael Mills, accused the band Led Zeppelin of burying satanic messages in their 1971 single, Stairway to Heaven. The messages contained in the song included, Master Satan, Serve Me, and There's No Escaping It. There's no okay. escaping it. Yeah. That is actually, and it makes me wonder, when he says, and it makes me wonder, backwards is translated into, there's no escaping it. Try it one more time. All right, I heard that one. All right, I'll slow this down a little bit. Uh, listen for, here's to my sweet Satan. Here's to my sweet Satan. Did y'all hear that? Many conservative parents and folks in the community could not even comprehend how someone could listen to such music much less enjoy something like that. To most, it was just noise, and horrible noise at that. To many, it was scary. It was disturbing. 
It was satanic. And that is what made metal the perfect scapegoat for many kids and artists looking for a way to express themselves in a manner that they had never been able to do before. For example, the band Merciful Fate and their record Nuns Have No Fun featured a nude nun tied to a stake at a satanic ceremony. This was never seen before. What wild cover is this? Why would someone put this on a cover? Because of the shock value. In a 1982 interview with The New Music, Geezer Butler, bassist and songwriter of Black Sabbath, claimed, If the moral majority don't understand it, they'll try to put it down, or get other people to read all sorts of things into it. Most people picked up on the satanic part of it. I mean, most of it was about stopping wars and that side of it. And some science fiction stuff. There wasn't that much satanic stuff. And what there was? It wasn't exactly for the devil or anything like that. It was just around at the time, and we just brought it to people's attention. In the documentary The Black Sabbath Story, Volume 1, Geezer Butler expresses his frustration at how fans misinterpreted the band's lyrics, stating that, for instance, on Hand of Doom, they'll pick up one sentence out of that and blow it up into this big thing, like as if we're telling everyone to go and shoot smack. The whole song is against drugs. If it wasn't the all-black outfits, the satanic references and lyrics, or the disturbing imagery in the album covers, metal would just be like everything else on the radio. But this new sound was kicking down boundaries with its instrumentation and live performance setting. Heavy, crunchy guitar riffs and chuggy breakdowns littered many of the most popular albums still loved and praised today. The metal vocal style is probably the most interesting development musically, in my opinion. It was completely different from what rock and roll used to deliver. Instead of clean singing, metal singers were growling, screaming out their lyrics, making demon sounds and guttural noises to emphasize their point of going against the grain. The best example of this transition is the death grind band Napalm Death and their debut album, Scum, released in 1987. Napalm Death is recognized now as the first grindcore band to hit the scene, but it's most notably the mumbling, yelling, almost non-singing that is the most memorable part. Well, that and the fact that the band successfully recorded a one-second song where they sing the meaningful lyrics of You Suffer, But Why. In my opinion, the punk band Bad Brains and their live performance at CBGB in New York in 1982 is a perfect example of the energy and vibe that we see at metal shows today. Just looking at this footage, my own grandmother, who is 80 years old now, watched my reaction to this performance and was laughing at all the various people jumping on and off stage, moshing, headbanging, and overall just having a wild time. She herself said she had never seen anything like that before. She had never seen people willingly jumping on and off stage and the artist being okay with it. Singing with their fans in the crowd, flailing around, sweaty, bloody, and most importantly, smiling. This footage could quite possibly have been the very first recording and or televised mosh pit. When I began researching for this video, every single article and recap mentioned the book Michelle Remembers. Many claim that the satanic panic began after the release of Michelle Remembers in 1980. To an extent, this is true. But what is important about this book is that for the first time, there was an actual first-hand account of a satanic cult survivor and that is the key word. This one book planted the seed for satanic rituals and cults being an active threat in the United States, targeting vulnerable victims, specifically women and children. A group of people whom at first I wasn't aware of what they were doing other than to a child. They were adults doing things I couldn't understand and that frightened me. About three months, three and a half months into the remembering, I realized through the ritual and repetition that these people had, that they were involved in some type of satanic church. Michelle Remembers was written by Dr. Larry Pazder, 
a Victoria psychiatrist, and his patient, Michelle Smith, a local housewife who sought treatment after a miscarriage. Under Pazder's care, Smith underwent recovered memory therapy, which is a form of treatment specifically designed to elicit from the client forgotten or repressed memories of traumatic childhood events such as abuse. Therapeutic techniques included hypnosis and guided imagery. This is a practice that's since been discredited, but Michelle remembers recounts Dr. Larry Pazder and Michelle's extensive sessions together. Michelle Smith claims that her nightmare began at the age of five when her mother gave her away to a satanic cult. For 14 months, she would be held captive and tortured, witnessing ritual murders and mutilations, many involving babies. The public gobbled this up, and as book sales took off, its authors became regular fixtures on TV, even appearing on an episode of Oprah. You know, there are thousands of men and women who are secretly worshipping the devil, the devil in this country. So if you'd like to join that audience on Thursday when we discuss Satanism, call now to reserve your seat. The number. Perhaps more incredible still, Pazder and Smith were quickly established as authorities in satanic ritual abuse, also known as SRA. Psychiatrists and members of law enforcement would turn to them as experts on this brand new subject. Psychotherapy played a key role in the satanic panic, the Oregonian states. Cutting-edge therapists increasingly searched for repressed memories during the Reagan years, and the surfaced memories seemed to frequently end up involving satanic cults. In the 1980s, it took on a new, more powerful dimension, which was mostly due to the feminist movement's emerging focus on domestic abuse. The result of Michelle Remembers was a best-selling work of horror, a memoir with a paperback tagline that read the shocking true story of the ultimate evil, a child's possession by the devil. A similar form of success was seen after 16-year-old James Dallas Egbert III's death. A lot of people used this hype from his story, Death by Dungeons and Dragons, to market themselves and their work. For example, author Rona Jafe wrote a book called mazes and monsters based on what happened to Egbert which was later turned into a film starring a very young Tom Hanks the detective hired to look for him William Deere also played on the D&D angle of the case to launch himself into the limelight writing his own book on the subject in 1984 TSR the then publishers of D&D even saw a rise in sales following the release of Egbert's story it's not new or surprising that people back then were eager to make money and receive fame for lies they tell to the media or simply for profiting off the misfortunes of others. This seems to be a common theme throughout many of the important events of the satanic panic. What also seems to be a similar theme is false accusations. Many companies and many innocent people were being accused of either being in the occult or doing certain things that cultists normally do usually involving some sort of abuse. But I also want to be clear, there were many horrible people who committed crimes throughout the satanic panic where the public accused them of being a part of the occult when they were simply just creepy, horrible, murderous people. A famous early case of the satanic panic linked to a crime was the case of Ricky Cazzo, who was also known as the Acid King. Ricky Cazzo killed his friend Gary Lawyers in Northport, New York. Cazzo had an interest in the occult and would talk to his friends about Anton LaVey's book, The Satanic Bible. But his friends would deny that he was interested in the occult and said it was more about being edgy and offending people in the community. Cazzo also had a group of friends who called themselves Knights of the Black Circle and were accused of being a satanic cult though there was no evidence to prove this. At the time of his arrest, Ricky Cazzo was wearing an ACDC shirt and was a fan of Judas Priest and Black Sabbath. This obviously did not sit well with many people in the community. He died in June of 1984, after just two days of being in jail for the murder of his friend. There were many crimes during this time that were blamed for Satanism. 
For example, in 1984, a crime was brought to trial in Vancouver for Miss Gail Lorraine Ray for the shocking murder of her six-year-old daughter. Ray, known as Big Gail, said she held a plastic bag over her daughter's face while trying to remove a piece of pepperoni that had become lodged in the girl's throat. I tried to get her to respond in every way I could, Ray said. I figured I'd put a plastic bag over her face and get her to at least gasp for air, and she didn't. The jury didn't buy it and quickly found the woman guilty of first degree murder. Prosecution witnesses during the trial testified that Ray was a high priestess in a satanic cult. Another story was there was a cult led by a drug dealer named Adolfo Constanzo. Cult members murdered more than a dozen people near the U.S.-Mexico border in the late 1980s. They reportedly believed their ability to tap into satanic powers would make them invisible and bulletproof. The first part of Mark Kilroy to be found four weeks later was his brain. People magazine wrote of the search for one of the cult's victims. It turned up in a black cauldron and it had been boiled in blood over an open fire along with a turtle shell, a horseshoe, a spinal column, and other human bones. His ritual death and dismemberment had been carried out in service to religion, a bizarre drug-demented occult religion practiced by an American marijuana smuggler operating out of Mexico. Constanzo was later killed in 1989 by some of the cult members on his own order as police closed in on them. If all these various murder stories weren't enough, you will be shocked to find out that even more of the most famous serial killers were beginning to rampage the United States as well. Famous names such as the Night Stalker, the Ripper Crew, and the Fall River Killers. Everything escalated to a peak during the mid to late 1980s. People were afraid. Parents were afraid. Many law enforcement officers began creating special training videos to help others identify signs of satanic cults and cult-like behavior. Here would be cut where the blood would have been drained and oftentimes there's wax laid on it to cover it up afterwards, after the body um, has uh, deceased. There were massive witch hunts of everybody, including companies like Procter & Gamble, otherwise known as P&G, who owned the laundry detergent brand Tide. P&G were accused of having a satanic company logo. It was so bad that there were many states that were passing laws to help protect children from ritual abuse. This moral panic similarly saw large swaths of the country swept up in the belief that hostile outside agents sought to steal children in mass in order to abuse and or kill them as part of a practice of devil worship. This baseless idea even ensnared some lawmakers, leading to passage in the Missouri General Assembly of House Bill 1370 in 1990. This is a quote from the Missouri Legislative Library. This brings me to probably the most famous satanic panic case that actually went to trial. It's even considered the longest and most expensive criminal case in the history of the United States legal system, where there were ultimately no convictions. This is the McMartin Preschool Story. It was 1983 in Manhattan Beach, California, when Judy Johnson, mother of her two and a half year old son, who attended McMartin Preschool for about 10 days, came to detectives and told them that the owner's 25 year old son, Ray Bucky, abused her son. Despite the fact that the young boy was unable to identify Ray from photos and medical investigations of the boy showed no signs of abuse, the police searched Ray's home and found evidence to support their claim. Their evidence included a rubber duck, a teddy bear, and a Playboy magazine, among other things. Ray Bucky was ultimately arrested on September 7, 1983. The next day, Police Chief Harry Kohlmeyer sent out letters to 200 McMartin preschool parents, asking them to question your child to see if they have been witness to a crime or if they have been a victim. Judy Johnson's story of the McMartin preschool would become increasingly bizarre when she claimed that Ray's mother, Peggy Bucky, was involved with the satanic cult. She claimed that 
Peggy Bucky took her son to a church where the boy was made to watch a baby being beheaded and then was forced to drink blood. There were a variety of other lucrative things she claimed Ray did, including prancing around the school in a Santa Claus costume. Eventually, most prosecutors realized that Judy Johnson was building her story around paranoid delusions. However, this did not stop the district attorney from pressuring the parents of McMartin preschool students into sending their children to two-hour interviews with the CII, or Children's Institute International for Examination. The CII is an agency that focuses on the treatment of abused children. These children generally denied seeing or hearing about anything at first. However, after much pressing, eventually many gave the detectives at CII what they wanted to hear. This resulted in 384 former McMartin preschool students being diagnosed as abused. On March 22, 1984, a grand jury indicted Ray Bucky and his mother, Peggy Bucky, his sister, Peggy Ann, Virginia McMartin, who's the founder of the preschool 30 years earlier, and three other McMartin teachers. The grand jury initially indicted the McMartin Seven, as they were called, on 115 counts of abuse. Two months later, an additional 93 indictment counts were added, as District Attorney Robert Philobosian pursued his strategy of hyping the McMartin case to boost his chances in an upcoming primary election. In June, bail for Peggy Bucky was set at $1 million. Ray Bucky was held without bail. Searches of the McMartin preschool and the homes of defendants failed to produce much incriminating evidence. No photographs were discovered, despite the insistence of investigators and parents that such photography was commonplace at McMartin. No evidence was found of the secret rooms where massive instances of abuse were said to have taken place. In March 1985, a group of nearly 50 McMartin parents began digging at a lot next to the school, determined to unearth the secret tunnels. A few days later, the parents were joined in their efforts by an archeological firm hired by the district attorney's office, and yet still no secret rooms were ever discovered. The defense repeatedly tried to raise questions as to how abuse on such a massive scale could have gone undetected for years and suggested that much of the testimony of the prosecution's child witnesses was flatly unbelievable. They aggressively cross-examined a parade of prosecution witnesses, including allegedly abused children, McMartin parents, and therapists, and medical experts. After two trials that resulted in a deadlock jury and a mistrial both times, the district attorney chose not to retry Ray Bucky a third time, and all charges were dropped on him, his mother, and the rest of the staff for McMartin Preschool. In the end, this entire trial lasted seven years and cost a whopping 15 million US dollars. But this was just the beginning. In 1985, a committee of concerned women formed the Parents Music Resource Center, or PMRC, to protect children from music with themes of violence, drug and alcohol usage, sexual themes, or the occult. They compiled a list of particularly offensive songs they called the Filthy 15, which called out mostly heavy metal bands like Wasp, Venom, Merciful Fate, and good old Black Sabbath, just to name a few. The PMRC was not just your average group of women. They were known as the Washington Wives. The PMRC was founded by Tipper Gore, wife of Senator and later Vice President Al Gore, alongside the wives of 10 senators, six representatives, and a cabinet secretary. Parent Music Resource Center was formed in 1985 and is still active today. And a fun fact about the PMRC, it was financially backed by Mike Love from the Beach Boys. And I don't know why, but knowing this detail feels like a betrayal to real music lovers and performers. Musicians Dee Snyder of Twisted Sister, Frank Zappa, and even country singer John Denver testified in court against the proposed censorship. On November 1st, 1985, before the hearing ended, 
The RIAA agreed to put parental advisory labels on selected releases at their own discretion. The labels were generic, unlike the original idea of a descriptive label categorizing the explicit lyrics. Many stores refused, however, to sell albums containing that label, most notably Walmart, and others limited sales of those albums to just adults. Three and a half decades later, and the now iconic black and white text continues to appear on covers, even on the JPEGs of album artwork included with digital releases. And in streaming services like Spotify, songs that include curse words will have an explicit warning that will be represented with a capital E below the song. After this decision to add these labels to records deemed inappropriate, many bands began writing music about their distaste for it. Dave Mustaine elaborated that the lyrics for Megadeth's song Hook in Mouth were about declaiming censorship and the PMRC. He claimed the song was a big middle finger to the people messing around with our constitutional rights and trying to take away our freedom of speech. Many metalheads released albums and songs after this hearing with parody parental stickers and songs talking about the PMRC. One of the most famous of these parody stickers was on Metallica's 1986 album, Master of Puppets, which had a parody warning in the shape of a stop sign. I won't read it out loud, but here's a picture so you can see. I think it's important to mention that some metalheads, as we know, did dabble with black magic. Not all of them, but I do think there is a sense of curiosity there for some. Most just faked an interest in it for the performance value. Most famously is the story of Dave Mustaine and the release of Megadeth's record Peace Sells But Who's Buying in 1986. Dave Mustaine refused to play their song The Conjuring for years as it had actual hexes in it. He had practiced with black magic when he was a teenager and even claimed to put spells on people. As the 80s began to close, two very important developments would occur. The first was the beginning of a new popular trash TV show called Geraldo, which premiered in 1987. Geraldo starred the talk show host, Geraldo Rivera, and it featured many things including controversial guests and topics with some theatricality. On October 22nd in 1988, Geraldo released the episode Devil Warship Exposing Satan's Underground. The synopsis on IMDb reads, Geraldo investigates allegations of a widespread satanic underground in the United States. He talks to investigators and looks at occult crimes and ritual murders that have been committed in the United States. He also speaks to self-identified Satanists who deny that Satanism is a dangerous religion. Do you feel it is inconsistent with a high-ranking officer pledged, sworn, to uphold the Constitution of the United States that you are also a practicing Satanist? Not in the least. The Army has known of my religion for the last 20 years. There has never been a problem with it, any more than there is a problem with other members of minority religions. But let me read from the Satanic Bible. Quote, one of, this is the, no, the number one, uh, uh, I guess, uh, commandment. Death to the weakling, wealth to the strong. How can you believe this and still uphold the Constitution of the United States? Death to the weakling? Well, for one thing, what you're looking at there is a highly polemical book that was never meant to be taken literally in Written all of its commandments. Zeman's father. Yes, and I'm aware of that, and I'm also saying that members of the Church of Satan understood that much of this book was in the form of a polemic. This episode did a lot to heighten the pandemic and increase fears for many conservative parents across the states. Geraldo basically said heavy metal and certain crimes were examples of mass amounts of Satan worshippers around the U.S. Geraldo also blamed Iron Maiden's Number of the Beast record for increasing Satanism amongst the youth. At the time, Geraldo's Satan episode brought NBC News the most views for a two-hour documentary. You start doing all this devil worship crap, because that's not my intention, although I have sang on a few songs about the devil. You know, that's about it. You know, I, I don't want anyone to harm themselves. However, it did lose a lot of advertisement interest just because of the subject matter, and advertisers did not want to be associated with satanic things. I'm kind of persecuted by everybody because I'm not a bad guy. I'm, I'm, my intentions are not 
to harm anyone. In fact, it's, dead, it's directly the opposite. Like when people come to my concerts, I want them to have a good, fun evening out, you know. And it's, it's, it seems to me that a lot of people judge the book by the cover more. more. So they, they write things about me where they don't even know that I talk, what they're talking about, you know. The second development that came in the late 1980s was the birth of the death metal genre. This is my personal favorite genre of metal, and it's also one of the more extreme. For those that are familiar with death metal and where its roots began, most of the well-known and famous death metal bands began recording and releasing music in Florida. Some of these household Floridian names included Death and their debut Scream Bloody Gore, which was released in 1987, Morbid Angel and their release Altars of Madness in 1989, an obituary with their debut, Slowly We Rot, in 1989 as well. All of these bands further increased the overall satanic and death message that had been paved for them by previous glam metal and heavy metal bands. I think it's quite ironic and hilarious that bands that are considered safe now, such as Guns N' Roses and Motley Crue, paved the road of satanism and metal music first before bands literally called Death, Possessed, and Obituary did. Death metal was much different than typical metal of the 80s. Like Napalm Death's record Scum, death metal had an intensity that wasn't for everyone. Slowly We Rot by Obituary also had the mumble metal singing that was featured with Napalm Death. Extremely deep, demon-style vocals layered every track. Guitars were massively filtered, everything was heavy, and everything used subliminal messaging throughout. And in June of 1990, the first true satanic death metal band, Deicide, would release their debut self-titled album, to the horror of most, but to the love of many. The ending of the Satanic Panic was not an abrupt one. Just like how the seeds of Satanism were planted almost two decades earlier in the 1960s, it would take almost a full decade for the roots of the Satanic Panic to die. And even then, many people today still believe that the panic never really went away. So many people were affected and many truly believed in this Satanic abuse. But there were also many people who had their doubts, and by the time of the late 1980s and definitely into the early 90s, media coverage for satanic ritual abuse began to turn negative. There was a growing list of scholars, officials, and reporters questioning whether SRA was actually a serious problem. The biggest reason for this change in perspective was the severe lack of evidence to prove satanic rituals were actually happening. Keep in mind, lawyers, teachers, and even police officers all believed that satanic cults were harming children and infecting the minds of teenagers. It was believed that young people would be going out into the woods and having ceremonies. It was such a sensitive matter that even something as simple as a skinned animal found in the woods would be taken as fake evidence for satanic rituals. If so many people were accused of being a part of the occult, and they were listening to metal and wearing ACDC t-shirts, why could no one find any evidence of rituals happening in their nearby neighborhoods? Wouldn't scent hounds and police searches come up with any physical evidence to prove that satanic rituals were happening? The police spent money and time making a video on it, so where was the proof? The short answer? There was none. In 1992, an FBI agent wrote a report that basically said there was no satanic rituals in the U.S. and that it was all made up. He said that it was a combination of child imagination, people pushing a specific narrative, and urban legend. He also stated that the satanic panic was probably one of the biggest conspiracy theories coming out of the 1980s. In 1995, HBO released a TV movie called Indictment, The McMartin Trial, which recast Ray Bucky as a victim of an overzealous prosecution over being a satanic abusive predator. This widely changed the public's perspective on satanic ritual abuse accusations. Also in 1995, Geraldo Rivera issued an apology for his 1987 television special, 
devil worship exposing Satan's underground. Over time, many officials who were experts in SRA began to lose credibility in their practice. And since media coverage of satanic rituals began to dissipate, this belief began to fall under the guise of just one large conspiracy theory. It was surprising to discover that when I googled the satanic panic, almost all of the articles that came up were all relatively new from within the last year or so. Now this wouldn't be surprising considering Netflix's show Stranger Things did bring back inspiration for satanic panic conversations with their latest season being released over the last couple years. But these articles never really mentioned Stranger Things unless they were talking about Dungeons and Dragons, which if you've seen the show, you would know that some of the main characters play that game from time to time. Nowadays, this conspiracy theory of satanic rituals is heavily tied to politics and certain online groups of which I won't get into. There are many theories involving a variety of politicians and many famous Hollywood actors and actresses as well as some of the world's most well-known billionaires. I truly believe the satanic panic is so deeply rooted in the cultural transition from the traditional family unit seen in the 1950s to the more independent, free-loving movement following feminism in the 1970s. This liberation movement, paired with the birth of metal music and the first church of Satan, set the stage for millions of more reserved individuals to question things out of the ordinary. It's quite fascinating, in my opinion, to observe what Americans actually created in arts and media over the last century. It's something we will probably never see again to this extent in our lifetime. And I think it goes without saying that with so much development and creativity within the feminist movement, it was also only a matter of time before people began to fear what they could not control nor what they could understand. But what if satanic rituals actually were happening? What if it's still happening now, just at a much more secretive level? Could these rituals be happening amongst the most powerful individuals on our planet? Or is it simply just a conspiracy theory built on fear of the unknown? A good and eerie topic of conversation to bring up on a cold winter night while camping. One of my favorite movie quotes is from World War Z starring Brad Pitt. In the film, Brad Pitt questions a scientist and asks him how he knew about the zombie apocalypse happening when all of his peers refused to believe that it would. His response, I think, perfectly sums up the satanic panic. The Tenth Man if nine of us with the same information arrived at the exact same conclusion, it's the duty of the tenth man to disagree. No matter how improbable it may seem, the tenth man has to start thinking with the assumption that the other nine were wrong. <laughs>